I'm just like super excited to have uh, Rosie here tonight. Uh, she is like a postdoc up at Harvard. Uh, she's done amazing things in the field of cosmology and black hole discoveries. And I know you're now kind of recently part of the Event Horizon Telescope uh, group, as I understand it. And I mean, just groundbreaking stuff that um is just exciting for all of us because it just you know stirs the imagination and you know we learn things about these these crazy weird objects that um are just just kind of blow us away and so it's just really ex exciting to have you i'm going to learn a lot i know um and we're going to ask you a lot of questions and i think you promised us that you would bring us all up to a level of understanding that was close to yours no i'm just i'm just kidding but uh, we That's really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> that okay. would be great. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think so, but I don't think it'll happen. But we appreciate your time tonight, Rosie, and uh, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your invitation. And tonight, I'm very excited to talk about some of the lessons that we learn about the supermassive black holes, especially their morphologies as probed by the most recent observations of the Event Horizon Telescope. So as, as actually, as Paul already mentioned, I'm going to actually, I'm going to convince us why this is so important to use the Event Horizon Telescope to monitor different sources and what we actually learn. So before I start, let me first warmly acknowledge all of my colleagues at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian, for all of their supports and kindness, actually both personally and for the entire of the ESG collaboration, that if I'm presenting anything, that's of course a lot of hands to them, for their actually kindness and support and everything. In particular, I would love to thank my closest collaborators and mentor actually for their very kindness and basically support throughout the entire of the analysis that we have done both for the data analysis and also for the actual images of the simulations. So in particular, I would like to warmly acknowledge my mentor, ESG mentor, Chef Dorman, for kindly bringing me to the ESG collaboration and also for advising me all the way through the entire of the analysis with a lot of cool discussions and supports and everything. So with all of this, Let's just start with the actually with the scientific part of the of the presentation. So let's first start with a very simple question. What is the event horizon telescope that I would call it just ESD? So if you actually if you want to basically if you have a dream to monitor the closed environment around any supermassive black holes in the nature, including the giant uh, elliptical source in M87 or our own Milky Way actually Sagittarius star, you really need to have a very big telescope of the Earth of the size, uh, basically of the size of the Earth, sorry, uh, or Earth size actually array, because you want to resolve a close proximity of the black hole, which is just very tiny. So that's almost impossible to build on a telescope that covers the entire of the Earth. That's just that's just super big, and it's not going to be affordable by anybody actually, even now or in or even in the future. So motivated by that, a couple of people actually came up with a very wise idea of having a global interferometry in which they try to pay wise all of the telescope around the globe that you see eight of them in completely different e regions on the Earth, and just try to link them and try to monitor actually close proximity of supermassive black holes. So first I started with M87, as I told you, and most recently we actually continued with monitoring Sagittarius star. So as I told you, without this interferometry actually technique that was impossible to monitor that close proximity of the supermassive black hole. But then with all of this, so then this is actually defining what is the ESG and why do we need that interferometry? Because motivated by all of these that are actually centered around the globe, you can have a virtual telescope that is the size of the Earth and you can just monitor different sources with the resolution that is desired and required to monitor different sources. So with that, let me actually tell you 
what PhD observed post century of monitoring the statue star. This is the Milky Way. And you are approaching the black hole at the center of it, that is the statue star. As you see, there are a lot of photos of all the matters that make the light very hard for us to find. Here we go. So at the end of the day, we were able to monitor the Sagittarius star at the center of the Milky Way. That was remarkably interesting for a lot of people around the globe that you see that right after May 12 in 2022, in just a month or so actually by now, a lot of people from around the globe, they try to actually come up with all of this news in the first page of newspapers. But why this is so important? As we all know, or we may know, that was the second discovery of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration to image a black hole or supermassive black hole. So the first one was in 2019 when ESG collaboration came up with a beautiful image of M87. So you may ask why this is so essential to try different sources and in this case particularly why we did care a lot about Sagittarius star. So in order to respond to this question, which is very much motivated, let me start with what ESG observed in 2019. In 2019, ESG came up with a smiley image of a ring light structure of M87, giant or super giant elliptical galaxy with a mass of billions of solar mass, which is away from us by 55 million light, 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 light curves actually light light sorry and that was incredible because ESG was able not to only resolve the basically supermassive black hole at the center of M87 but it was also possible for it to also resolve the basically shadow at the center and by shadow I mean the depression of the light that you are actually seeing in this in this basically image so that was incredible because motivated by that we could also measure the black hole mass and a lot of other properties and angular scale of the basically M87 in the sky. So then that was the first discovery and that was very much actually treated well in the community. But now the next question is, um, is actually Sagittarius star. So in order to actually uh, go a step by a step on the importance of this discovery and the steps that people have done to come up with this image that I'm actually showing on the right, Let's just make a little bit of comparison between the M87 and Sagittarius star. On the left, we see the size and image of M87, while on the right, we focus on the Sagittarius star. So by the M87 size, in order to compare them with some of the things that we may have a better actually, you know, understanding of them, is actually the size of the entire of our solar system. As it turns out, M87 is even bigger than the entire size of the solar system, while Sagittarius star is only actually of the size of the Mercury orbit. So you see that how much they are different. They are also different actually in terms of their mass and distances actually by order of basically 1,000, 1,400 in mass and about 1,000 actually in terms, of the, in terms of the basically distance. So all of them would actually lead to the following uh, basically fact about Sagittarius star that the time variability scale for Sagittarius star is much, much shorter than the time variability scale for M87. If I want to put some numbers into it, the time scale for the variability of Sagittarius star is only 20 seconds, while that is for M87 about nine hours. What that means is that during the eight hours of the observation of Sagittarius star by, by basically ESG collaboration, that was just, the source was just incredibly actually varying over the time and that made a life completely actually on out of the control for the scientists to actually to basically image such a source so they had to come up with a lot of actually wise ideas to how to monitor that again having this actual source in one night or four nights of the observation ap 2017 
that was analyzing the data, that was not that easy. So that's one of the parts that you're so to finally be able to image the Sagittarius star after a lot of these complexities. Other to add, uh, basically, as I already show you a movie, in order to see the Sagittarius star in the sky, you have to go over all of the stars and they're actually foregrounds basically, and you have to remove them. So basically considering those scatterings and refraction and everything, that was incredibly hard. So both of them required a lot of digging into the data and also algorithm or rebuilding the algorithms that I will just describe in a moment that owing to them, now we are able to actually to basically monitor the strategy star and also unpack its morphology. So let's start with actually a little bit of more technical details about the methodologies that people invented to image the Sagittarius star. So there is something called geometrical modeling that include both the snapshot modeling and full track actually analysis. So in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna to briefly introduce both of them completely intuitively and actually tell you that at the end of the day, both of these techniques are gonna to give us completely reasonable and close results. So let's start with the snapshot modeling. So actually, so without, uh, without that, basically, I can, okay, I can just summarize even the geometrical modeling without basically going to the details of a snapshot and full track. And the common thing is that this methodology is gonna to be used in both of these models. So we we'll start with that. The geometrical modeling for Sagittarius star includes actually a basically, you know, brightness profile that we use for our fitting, which is a symmetric ring with the basically diameter with a symmetry of the ring that is actually a ring that we call it here, and also with a, a little bit of thickness to the ring. In addition to that, there is also a Gaussian component. And you see that throughout the observations actually of the data versus different models with different M rings and also different components of the Gaussian with actually different basically, you know, thickness and also diameters, you are gonna to get closer or get deviated from the data. So now from now on, I'm gonna to use this geometrical modeling and then just consider basically both the snapshot modeling and full track analysis. So we start with the snapshot modeling. What does that actually mean? As I already told you, because of the basically, because of the fact that Sagittarius star is very much time variable, it just means that throughout eight hours of the observation per night, you're seeing a lot of variation in the source. So your source is not a static. So how you could even image or actually monitor basically that rapidly changing source over the course of the observation or even over multiple days of the observation. There was a very clever and actually voice technique that is called a snapshot modeling in which you can just say that you're completely understanding that Sagittarius star is time variable. So let's just divide it to many time, many actually, many basically many different uh, chunks of the observations that each of them could be just about two minutes duration as you see them here and for each of them you can see that this is almost around the time scale for the variability that is being seen in Sagittarius star and that's exactly the way to go because if this is around that time you can ignore any time variations or any time variabilities in the source and you could just go and fit an M ring as I already described it to you in this geometrical modeling. And you can do it for all of different snapshots that you have, many plenty of them, because we have eight hours of the observation, we have multiple days of the observation, and you could imagine that for each of them, you have many chunks of the data that each of them are about basically two minutes or so. So the very cool thing is that you can do all of these fittings for chunks of two minutes, each of them, and then you can try to combine them. So you can just see that on the, basically on the top, you see actually a GRMSG simulation that consider a lot of different chunks of the data that are told, that are actually, that I told you that, you know, that's basically uh, the, you know, splittings of the observation, while on the bottom for each of them, we have a snapshot fitting using our geometrical model. So all of the credits for all of the slides that I'm actually showing is just to the ESG collaboration because that's 
plus about 300 people around the globe that came up with all of this analysis. So then what this actually left to us is that as soon as you have this average of the geometrical feet that you actually see them on the left, you can just try to compare them with the average of the input of the simulation, which is great, which is really great and amazing. You see that the distribution of the brightness and also the peak of the brightness and the shadow, it's just very much similar, basically from the left and from the right panels, which really tells you that if you also want to try it for the data, because that was just, you know, that was just a try for the GRMSG simulation. But if you also want to try with the ESU observations, that should also give you very actually compelling results. So that's actually the summary of the snapshot modeling. In short, if you really want to feel the same as I feel do, as I feel actually as, as I do feel basically, is that you have the strategy star, which is completely variable over the course of observation. You basically make a lot of chunks of the data, and then you make a lot of fits to them individually, and you can bind them all together to actually see something which is that as stable as it is on the left. And you compare them with this with the basically simulations. But why do you do this actually? As uh, as I described uh, very frequently during this talk, the simulations that we are using is really our lab on our table actually that we could just try to basically validate actually and cross check all of the methods that we have been using for checking the ESG data. But we had to first do it with the simulation themselves and then try to use it for the actual data. So in this case, the close proximity of the results that we see for the average of the input versus the feed is really incredible. So with that note, let me go to the food track modeling of Sagio Star. But what, what is this food track actually means and why this is important? Why we didn't stop when we already did the analysis for the snapshot fitting? That was incredible as I already showed you. The reason to it is exactly the time variability of the source. So you might just say that in addition to have a lot of chunks of the data and a splitting of the observations, as I just described, you would also see, or you would also like to see or get a sense of the global structure and global behavior of such a star. In order to do it, actually, we try to make an average over the observation and then try to fit them. So in this case, when you average, you can also compute actually something which is called residual. So you could actually, the way to think of it is as the following. Imagine that you have a movie like that, and it's just time variable as you see them. You can first compute the average of them, the time average of them, which is a static, and then you can just compute the residual of the average with respect to the original movie. So we try to model this residual, the random fluctuations that is just coming from many, many, many orbits of the of the actually basically light around the Sagittarius star. So we try to basically model these actually random fluctuations. In order to do it, we went to the visibility. In order to be very much actually intuitive, it's just like getting the Fourier transformation of the image. Go to the space that is called the visibility actually. And we try to do the same. We try to, in this time, we try to make an average of the brightness plus something that is actually called the noise modeling. So we went for actually some broken power law and we tried to fit for these parameters. So in another world, if I want to be super intuitive in my explanation, imagine that the light is just orbiting one time and two times and 10 times and hundreds of basically times and basically tens of hundreds of times and so on and so forth. So that would be really random work. So you could imagine that you have an average that you can extract it from the entire of the motion and then the leftover would be a random work. And then that would be actually the noise that we just tried to use it in order to fit it to the data. And then we just did the same. We just tried to actually come up with the amplitude with the U naughts that we call it for four giga lambda basically. And then for the for different actually power laws of this actually of the noise modeling. So then using that, we try to actually come up with some measurement of the diameter of the Sagittarius star. As I already told you, when I try to actually motivate the geometrical modeling, I try to motivate it just telling you that you can imagine you have a ring 
which is asymmetric. That just means that as a mutary, you have some different distribution of the brightness at different as a motor angle. And this ring has a diameter and also a thickness. So these are the parameters that you actually see here. We tried many different techniques as you see here. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to go over all of them using different techniques, using different algorithms, either a snapshot or actually the full track basically, or some image-based analysis. And we tried to measure what is the diameter of the ring? That actually tells you in the sky, on the sky when you actually see the Sagittarius star, what is the diameter that you associate with the Sagittarius star? In addition to that, we also try to ask what is the thickness of the ring that you associate and also the asymmetry. So these are all the results. And in the first glance, this is super clear that they are completely consistent with each other. Sometimes we also had to go to actually basically, you know, combining different bands like the low bands and high bands and also different techniques using different algorithms. But at the end of the day, we didn't actually reasonable error bars. We got very similar results. So why this is important? Because as soon as you have the diameter of the ring, you could actually use some other techniques and try to come up or try to combine or try to connect actually this geometrical modeling to some mass measurement. So we know that physically mass is one of the most important parameters of a source. And I'm telling you that if you were able to estimate the diameter of the ring, you can use very simple formula that try to actually tell you the size of the source that you see on the, actually on the sky has something to do with its mass and also to basically, and also with this distance to Earth, and you can just calibrate for some coefficient that is here that I will describe it in a moment. And you can then try to actually invert it and compute the mass of Sagittarius star. So one of the achievements of the ESG measurement or ESG observation was actually measuring the mass of the Sagittarius star. And uh, very intriguingly, that was also compatible with what was actually formerly observed by Crick, by the stellar orbits, and also by the VLT, actually. So you see here that this is actually something that is called alpha calibration, and it has something to do with the fact that this proportionality constant can be calibrated or can be computed using the GRMHD simulations that I already told you several times. So again, GRMHD simulations are very key, actually, in all of our analysis just to calibrate, just to validate and test basically different techniques. And in this case, even compute a coefficient, which is very really important to estimate the mass of Sagittarius star. So that was actually the first part of this talk that I tried to actually tell you what we observed by the ESG in terms of the diameter of the source and in terms of some mass measurement. So let me actually go to the second part of the talk. That is now about the GRMHD simulation themselves. So, so far, I've been using GRMHD simulation as a helper for us to better understand the observation or to extract more physical quantities from the observation. But GRMHD simulation themselves, they also have a lot of varieties. You can have magnetically arrested disk which actually refers to very strong magnetic field around the Sagittarius star or around any other actual resources. Or you could have basically same models that refer to very weak magnetic field actually, you know, morphology actually. So the question, the key question here is that our current observation by the ESG collaboration actually would prefer which of them? Is this any preference? after using the ESG observation and after combining this with the rest of observations of lower frequencies or higher frequencies and so forth. And I'm happy to tell you that this is for the first time, yes, for Sagittarius star. Former to this observation, all of the models that I'm gonna to describe to you in a moment were almost actually possible. And we really didn't have also preference over which model are gonna to be preferred to be actually a good description of our GRMHDs. So this is actually motivates me to begin these explorations together with you. And here is actually the way to do it. 
So in the left, I'm actually going to tell you stature store analysis from Alwa that was done in April 7, 2017. So this is the brightness or the light curve, the ones that I was actually telling you before. And on the right is actually your MSG simulation and the light curve for them over the time. So the key here is just to compare the time variability from the left, that is the observation, to the right, that is actually the simulation. And also the morphology in terms of the structure that you see in the brightness, actually in the visibility, and so on and so forth. So again, the question, the main question is that around the library of different models that people actually consider for decades by now, which of them are going to be better preferred or which of them are going to be completely rolled out by the ESG observation. So in order to prepare the library or the so-called model zoo for this exploration, we consider many different models actually, millions of different images that were computed using different sets of GRMHD simulations, including Karma, Hammer, and Back. Just for those of you that don't actually, don't basically, don't live with these words or with these simulations, these are different initial conditions or different configurations of the simulations that we just tried to use. The reason for that was that we wanted just to be completely unbiased with our setup of the magnetic field and basically, and all the other actually torus initial conditions and so on and so forth. In addition to this set of standard models, we also tried to explore many different actually models that are basically at the level of different emissions, including Nathema models, including theta disk actually simulations, stellar wind accretion, some coral simulations that are very long, and also some critical beta models that are analytic. So again, the purpose of all of this was to prepare a very wide range of GRMHG simulations that then can be used to actually compare them against the data. And then we can get a better sense of the morphology of the magnetic field and so on around the staging star. So for each of them, in order to actually enlarge the library, we also try different inclination because prior to us, we really didn't know what is the inclination of staging star with respect to actually, with respect to our actually observers in the, on the Earth. That's how we describe it in a moment in some actually intuitive toy models afterward. But in order to capture that, we just try to consider different inclinations, different basically orientations for the, for the black hole, and also different emissions. We just consider cool electrons versus the hot electrons. And as you see here, from the left to right, we have different models, we have different inclinations, and also actually in this case, it's just the inclinations that we are just considering with different black hole spin. And we see that how much the brightness, how much the spectral and so forth are going to be changed. So we use all of this information to come up with some good estimation of the morphology of the Sagittarius star and the models that would be the best representative of that. So in this movie, I'm going to show you a representative set of these models and I'm going to tell you and also actually basically illustrate how much different observational constraints from the ESG and also beyond the ESG at different frequencies are going to almost roll out actually a lot of them and just come up with very few of them, which is really great. So with that, let's start with actually see how it actually applies the constraints and how much they're going to basically power off ourselves to basically roll out different models that are not supported by the data anymore. So let's start with actually with the ESG constraints. So we start with that, and soon you would actually see that the ESG actually is going to, the size of the ESG is going to just roll out some of the models. And then when you also consider the shape of the ESG, a lot of the models would be gone. You can continue with the spectrum as I already showed you. And then afterward, you can also go to 86 gigahertz basically size, and you see that only two of these models are going to be preferred. So in order to uh, actually, in order to demonstrate it even further, in this large basically, uh, you know, movie that I already told you or the library that I already show you, actually, we had both of the math and same models on the top 
we had the mat and on the bottom we had the same and we had different black hole spin versus different inclinations. And as you saw at the end of the day, only mad models that are actually prograde and almost basically inclined toward the Earth are going to be preferred. If I want to better describe it, as I already told you, only mad models that are prograde with low inclination and cool electrons were actually severed after doing that. So, what does that, uh, what does that actually imply for our understanding or intuition? of the orientation of Sagittarius star with respect to the Earth. So here is actually a, basically a cartoon that is going to demonstrate what we already observed. And this is the Sagittarius star. This is the Earth's actually line of sight. And this is the low inclination. As I told you already, low inclination models are those that are only are actually only those that are currently survived, basically, according to all of this combined set of different observations. So this is about 30-ish, or if you want a little bit more than 30-ish, actually around that, maybe less or uh, actually more than 30-ish, but definitely less than 70 degree of inclination with respect to the Earth. And if you want to combine this or actually compare that with the galactic angular momentum, you see that black hole rotation axis is almost perpendicular to the larger scale galactic angular momentum. So this is really intriguing and actually tells you that Sagittarius star is also inclined toward us very actually with a very low inclination. So that's very similar to M87 that was about 17 degree. So that's very intriguing. We then try to come up with the best bet model. Again, that's essential because as I already told you several times, GRMSG simulations are very key, they are very important for us to actually to as a test as a basically as a you know validation test or actually cross check or everything for every database analysis. So having this basically capability of actually rolling out a lot of different models and come up with only few models out of millions of different images, that was really milestone. So in order to tell you even more what we actually did in order to for the best per model, we tried to actually average the movie based on also the baseline that was actually being used by the time of the observation. We tried to come up with the ESG resolution that is about 20 micro second dictated by the actually Earth's diameter and also the basically 1.3 millimeter, which is the wavelength of the observation of ESG at 230 gigahertz. We tried to also reconstruct it using the basically uh, UV coverage of the ESG observation, specifically those telescopes that I told you that I already actually show you the pairs of the telescope. And we try to actually compare that with what was already observed by the EHD actually observation. So you see that despite the fact that there is an extra basically broad region here that as I've described, we may not really trust it too much. The morphology of the ring in terms of being ring actually, and also in terms of the size and everything match completely actually well with the observation. So that tells you that the actual constraints that you use for your best friend model completely from other way around, like doing the basically sizes, actually doing the shape, doing some spectral analysis, and also doing even low frequency actually constraints was well enough to give you some models that is that actually incredibly similar to what was already observed. So that's really incredible. You may ask me that, there are also some brighter region around here on the observed image of Sagittarius star on the sky that is not well captured by the reconstructed image as I already show you. But I can tell you that if you ask anybody else in this actually collaboration, they will tell you that we are not yet completely sure that we fully understood all of this because that could be because of different telescopes, that could be because of some, you know, contaminations and other things that we are not really sure about this, or even some noise out of the way that we average over the actual images and so forth. The fact is that unlike the MAG7, the way that we average over our actually observe, um, observe basically images, even using the observation, observational data was not completely actually, you know, how to say, stable, or in another word, the ringness actually, the ring structure was there, 
but sometimes you see that there was a little bit of differential changes or partial changes in the brightness distribution in the ring actually. So that tells you that you cannot completely rely on all of it and just use this against what you actually reconstructed. So with all of this grade actually succeed, let us go to actually do some better basically. Okay, let me let me tell you because that's very fun. So with all of this scientific actually discoveries, let us hear the Sagittarius star. So for those of us that were basically following the news from uh, from LIGO, for instance, every time that they come up with some discoveries, they also try to actually tell us how does the black hole sound. So for the first time, we also try to do the same for Sagittarius star. So this is the sonification of Sagittarius star in the radio as has been done by the ESG observation. And as you see in the ring that I just basically told you here, we just try to use different brightnesses that you actually see them. And we just try to basically make this sonification from basically clockwise from here to, to here again, and just try to see based on different frequencies that are coming from basically plasma that are orbiting around the supermassive black hole and also the asymmetry in the brightness, what is the sound of the Sagittarius star? So with all of this, let us enjoy actually hearing the Sagittarius star as observed by the radio. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that. But you may also ask me, since I already show you the multi-frequency analysis of Sagittarius star, how does that look like if I'm going to actually monitor basically these sounds or hear them, not only with the radio, but also with the near infrared, with the infrared and X-ray? And here Rossi, is actually how does it look like? Oh, go Rossi, ahead. Rossi, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't hear the radio. Oh, you are I'm, not. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's that's not good actually. How what why this happen? I don't know, Bob. Do you know, or Rob? Our Google slide Google is transmit muted. the audio. Uh, tell me again. Google Meet doesn't transmit the audio from your computer, just from your microphone. So that's why we can't hear it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Actually, yeah. And me today, you're gonna to miss that, but yeah, is there any ways that we could actually, we could show it or something? Yeah, honestly, Zoom does not, uh, yes, yeah, Zoom allow actually people to show it, so yeah. All right, so with that, maybe, maybe I can at least show it to you, but in terms of, all right. So do you, do you, do you see that, please? We saw the play mechanism uh, on the screen. Were you able to actually hear sound when uh, the uh, icon, the icon was swinging around? Oh no, that, yeah, I got you actually. So let let at least try and just you know just to see what is actually goes in terms of this. So here we just try to actually amplify basically or just increase the bright increase the volume when you go to some brightest actually region either by infrared or by near infrared or by X-ray. Actually, again, I apologize. I'm not, I should admit, I should admit that actually I'm more used to the Zoom than the Google, but uh, sorry about that. But, you know, hopefully I will share the slides later on and you will just hear it on your isolation. So that was a fun. I just tried to tell you that actually, you know, following the basically the strategy of actually, or, you know, or the culture of the logo in basically, you know, hearing what does the black hole actually sounds or something. We also try to do it not only for the ESG but also for multi frequencies. Again, credit to the ESG collaboration. So now, actually, with all of these basically great uh, achievements for Sagittarius Star, I am going to use a few minutes and just talk about the polarimetry of M87. I should also tell you that I think I'm actually I'm I'm supposed to finish in 45 minutes. Is that true? 
Yeah, that's a good target, Rosie. If if uh, okay. but uh, yeah, yeah, we but have a number of questions. Decide, actually, because for our Ministry of M87, I can just tell you very quickly that was a project that we were doing with a lot of my colleagues at the CFA, basically. And that's actually trying to use again the ESG data in 20 March of 2021 when they had the first discovery of the polarimetry of MAD7. And we tried to connect that and extract something about the basically magnetic field morphology and also the, you know, some velocity field and black hole speed and other actually quantities of the, of the features of the black hole actually that uh, we tried to basically monitor. So this is uh, this is actually pretty much ongoing, but I'm going to be very quick on that part because I'm going to link the current status of the ESG with the next generation of the ESG really quick. So in this actually plot, you're going to, I was hoping that I'm also having some time to also show you the technique that we develop in order to capture the emission and also try to actually use that to actually to just try to see whether some of the semi-analytical models that people came up with uh, called ring models are going to be similar to the geometry simulations and how it's actually going to tell you basically about the morphology of the magnetic field and also about the black hole speed. But at, as the time is actually passing too much fast, I am going to skip them through now that I told you also for different math versus the same simulations, but I'm going to tell you even actually something more fun. So after the ESG, the next question is what is the what is after the ESG actually, and of course this is like something that have a, a lot of people have a lot of ambitions to go for the next generation of the ESG, and that's basically reasonable because for any instrumentation, no matter how successful they are, no matter how wise they are, there is also a limitation that you could actually accept and you could just try to dream for even more than that basically. So that's the uh, that's an ongoing effort that, uh, for instance, Shep Domen is actually the uh, basically principal investigator of this actually NGESD. And we are going to try to basically see what we can learn or what we can explore for the next generation of the event horizon telescope that was not possible to be done basically using only the ESG collaboration or ESG actual instrument. So for that, one thing is that, okay, you know that Earth's diameter is fixed, so you cannot really increase the resolution if you actually just stick on the Earth, but you could try to improve the quality of the image. And I'm going to show you one quick example of it afterward. That's why this is so important, just that you can better see the motivation to actually to go for the next generation of the Event Horizon Telescope. But no matter what, let's start with the strategy. So strategy and the key question here is that imagine that you have basically a chance to add more and more stars on the globe in which you can just very easily improve the quality of your image. And now one key question is that where do you want to put your telescopes? This is very important because these are very costly. Millions of dollars actually would be required to come up with a very good instrumentation and very good architecture of the new sites that don't exist now. So it's very tricky. Where do you want to put them? Because if you if you build them and then see that they don't they don't work, you're gonna lose tons of actually millions of money. And that would not be actually that would not be basically desired. So motivated by the importance of such question, with a number of people at the CFA and beyond that, we are actually trying our best to actually to respond to this question. We're trying to ask ourselves, where should we put our sites actually? There are various different techniques for it. One of them is brute force, and the other one is just like the interaction of the size. And I'm going to tell you that I'm more involved in the second one, in which we just try to go for some optimized search for the new size of the NGESD, in which we are trying to model the site interaction with the fully connected Ising model. So the way to see it is that imagine that you are going to add more and more size on the globe. Of course, there are a lot of costs, human costs actually, and also basically the money costs and many other factors and how much you gain after doing all of it. Maybe you gain very little for some of the locations and you get much further for other locations actually. So for that, we tried to come up with the Ising model actually, that was firstly actually discovered by, by a very uh, clever person 
Hassan that is now actually in Peking University, uh, uh, basically a professor there. Formerly he was a postdoc in Caltech University, and he came up with the IZ model that is both actually monitoring the site activities individually and also their interaction. So in, in this case, we try to come up with the ESG because we know how they behave and we try to add more and more size and monitor both the interaction of the size and, as well as their correlation. And we come up with 50 size at the end. And that was incredibly hard to scale it up to include all of the size because we want to know which of them we have to go for, which of them we don't need to go and which of them we absolutely don't need them. So that's actually pretty much you know, work in progress to really add all of the size and just try to see which one is really must go and which one is really no go. But why do you need that many size? That's exactly the question that I'm going to motivate with one physical example, which is the orbits of the hotspot in the NGHD. So what I'm going to show you here is that this is basically tracing the orbits of the hotspot using the NGHD and from the left to right, also in different rows, actually in different columns, you're going to see actually, especially from uh, from top to bottom, you're going to see different uh, snapshots of a hotspot, which is orbiting plasma near the black hole. And you're going to observe them by different arrays, specifically from left to right, ESG 2017, ESG 2022, the first basically phase of NGSG and the second phase of the NGSG. And we are going to see which of them not only one a snapshot, but also throughout the dynamics of the actual motion are going to capture well or better the motion of the orbiting plasma. As you see here, despite the, all of the actually succeed of the ESG, unfortunately, tracing the orbit of the plasma is just so hard and it's just so actually tiny that it's not possible to be traced by the ESG. You said that we were not able using different arrays or different actually different architectures or different parameters of fine tuning, we still were not able to capture the motion very well at all. However, when you add some size in the first phase of the NGSG and also the full phase of the NGSG, you really incredibly well see that you are going to actually localize the brightest basically plus or the brightest actually, you know, points of the hotspot. And not only that, you can actually also monitor this and trace the dynamics really well in terms of the actual orbits that is the brighter region. So I can tell you that this is incredibly hard because these are very tiny and it's just like the already the Rai of mother as a background. So that was very hard and that really motivates us that you see that in these two cases, the bright region is not even the region that is actually must be. But when you go to the NGHG, you can actually see that you see some brighter region that is the arc that is actually being captured by the hotspot. So if you want to even see it slightly better, here is a movie again from the left to right. You see actually from the original model and also the recovered or reconstructed from, e from different areas of the ESG and also NGHG. And you see that over the time, how much is actually the orbit is going to be captured by the by different areas of ESG and also the NGSG. So as you see here again, this is start from here and it's actually get orbits, you know, around and you can very easily see them in NGSG that is unfortunately not possible by the ESG. So that tells you that the ability of the NGSG in tracing the orbits of this hotspot really tells you that this is very useful actually, you know, explorations or even just a dream to have and also necessary to unpack the dynamics of the gas around supermassive black holes in this actually percentile basically behavior. So with that note, let me go and actually conclude my talk. And I apologize that if that was a little bit long. So I'm going to tell you that actually, you know, okay. What I already told you, sorry, was that the most recent uh, discoveries of the ESG should realize about the morphologies of the M87 as such a star. We already saw that for some reasons that we don't understand basically both of the sources that we well studied them in much detail prefer very donut shaped actually uh, structure no matter what is their mass and diameter which is very funny we actually were able to basically measure the mass of Sagittarius star which is really consistent with other measurements as i already told you 
by the stellar orbits and also by the uh, by the VRT. And we also motivated the next generation of the ESG, which would be enable us to actually to really get more information about the structures and dynamics of the gas basically near to the supermassive black hole. So I stop here and thank you so much for your invitation. I'm happy to take questions if any. Hey, Rosie, thank you so much. Uh sure. <laughs> Sorry yeah. for being a little bit actually be over the time, but oh, I, just, no, that's okay. yeah, I just wanted to tell you all of it. No, that's that's fantastic. I mean, uh, we we appreciate your time, so no worries at no all. Worries. I I know we got a lot of questions in the chat box, and uh, if you don't mind, we're just going to kind of walk them down here. Uh, so John posted the first one. John, you want to ask? Get you on mute still. <laughs> Yes. Can you there hear you me? Go. Yep. Uh, I, this is really a basic question about the structure of any black hole, uh, supermassive or otherwise, I suppose. Uh, and it, it had to do with my understanding of the... John Birch got ahead of me. I'm sorry? Yeah, I've called on John, and we have two Johns with, <laughs> with questions I'm that are back-to-back. -back. So, J, JB, take yours. And <laughs> John, McDonald. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> so uh, the, the question was uh, whether the relatively slow rate of time uh, in the is is due to the pressure uh, within the black hole, or uh, that is the density, I suppose, or the curvature of space, that is the gravity, which varies uh, in a sinusoid, well, a partial sine wave, I guess, as you approach the center of the black hole. Yeah, that's actually, that's a very good, basically, a question. So I think that, yeah, so that really depends on your, actually, oh, yeah. on your mass scale. Okay. It's gone. It's gone. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. So I think that that would actually, that's a very good point, because that would actually, so gravity mostly care about the mass. So let's begin with that, actually. So what gravity and curvature curve, basically, care is basically the mass, right? Because we know that the mass is just, the source of the curvature on any supermassive black hole is just the mass. So that's just similarly to what I actually told you, that will be basically, you know, GM over C square. So for Sagittarius star, it's also similar to the light, cro basically light crossing, uh, sorry, time scale. That is about, you know, just about a minute, but for MAG7 is about hours, actually, a few hours, you know, nine hours, as I told you. So long and short, that depends on your actually on your mass of the supermassive black hole that really dictates the dynamics at that close proximity of the supermassive black hole and owing to that that basically differs from one source to the other well the curvature presumably would be uh equal for any uh Schwarzschild radius wouldn't it no matter wh how, what that radius is Whatever it is for that black hole, that's where the escape velocity is the speed of light, correct? Yeah, but actually, but that also dictates by the by the mass of the black hole, right? So this is just like, okay, nice. So the curvature, what is the okay? So let me put it this way. That's a good point because for the for the supermassive black holes, the horizon scale is actually given by the mass. So it's just proportional to the mass of the black hole itself. So of course the light is just gonna to have the same speed, but that light crossing time in this actually and the environment of the black hole is different. And you can imagine that when you're actually when your emission is basically is really dominated by the synchrotron emission, that just means that around the supermassive black hole there are, uh, there are photons that are gonna to be emitted and just actually pass toward us and they're gonna to be orbiting around. So that really depends on your mass scale of the supermassive black hole. So okay. hope that is a little bit more convincing now. Well, that that brings me to the main question, and that is, uh, if it is due to the gravity at that point, uh, mm -hmm. does that mean the rate of time uh, fluctuates in the same way? In other words yeah you could uh, scale them yeah exactly that's a great point again you can uh, scale them uh, you can uh, scale them up and down by the mass of the black hole because that's the only key parameter so in fact 
that's again another good point that you are mentioning. If you really look at the basically such a store on MAG7, from the pure gravity perspective, they are just incredibly similar to each other because such a store is here on MAG7. Such a store is about 27,000 actually uh, light from us basically, but uh, basically what the MAG7 is about 55 million. And that just means that, you know, if you really uh, scale them similar to each other, then the dynamics wouldn't be different, you know? So I, I, I agree with you actually. So, Mass is the key here. Right, so my question is, uh, if time stands still at the event horizon, uh, uh -huh. does it go back to normal at the center of that black hole? Uh, sorry, uh, tell me does, again. Does the rate of time with uh -huh. respect to the normal space, uh, does that go back to normal when you're in, a, in the weightless environment at the very center of the black hole? Well, actually, you know, Again, what actually, okay, when it's come down to the variability, that's basically, that's actually, okay. Firstly, you could also see that if this is only the light, yes, because light has the same actually as speed, but light has a smaller pass to go over to finish one orbit of it in MAD, in Sagittarius star than in MAD7 by a factor of thousand. But if it goes to the plasma, no, the orbits of the plasma around MAD7 is much faster because that's basically, that's the centrifugal force that is being dictated by the mass, you know, of the, uh, by the enclosed mass actually. So yeah, we can, maybe we can discuss it further offline or something, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks JB. All right, so John McDonald, we're up to you now. Uh, this may be self-evident and I'm just not seeing it, but if nature can make black holes out of mass that is less than the entire universe before the big bang when the universe was very concentrated couldn't that have been a black hole yeah or that's a great point actually it could be yeah you know who knows basically actually there are even some points that uh, now we are living in a black hole in a super giant black hole you know unfortunately before the before the Big Bang, you don't have any evidence of what was actually happening. But you know, but something that is also relevant to what I've been actually doing for my PhD, for instance, is actually cosmic inflation. So cosmic inflation tells you that the fluctuations that has been crossed to be classical afterward, they were actually initially completely quantum fluctuations inside the horizon, and they get amplified and they got classical and they get actually pushed out and they were basically the seeds of the structures that we see today. So in this case, it's just it's just a little bit counterintuitive that you just imagine that nothing should come out of the black holes. So I cannot really call those black holes, but you know, but you, there are some there are some thoughts that there were some fluctuations that were initially coming from the horizon inside and then they were just they were actually get you know outside and you know, just became classical. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. Let's see, Rob. You had actually like three different questions here. Do you want to want to go through go through all of them? Let me bring them up so that I remember what I was going to ask. Uh, fantastic presentation, by the way. And uh, I I might be contacting you to see if you would be willing to talk at uh, George Mason University. Um, sure. So uh, my first question was, so maybe I'm making an assumption that isn't right. Uh, so the, the gas that you're seeing around or the bright ring that you're seeing around the, the supermass hole, supermassive black hole, I'm assuming is the accretion disk. If that's yes. correct, is there a way to actually image the torus surrounding the uh, supermassive black hole? Yeah, that, that's really great point. Let me share my actual presentation again with you actually. Yeah. That's really incredible. Do you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Uh, do you see? We see uh, your whole screen, not just your presentation. Okay. Okay. How could I show you the presentation? Okay. What well, do you? you okay. Show us detail. Yeah, I can see the slides. So I mean, if you just okay, that'll work too. All right. Now works, right? 
Does that do you, okay? Does that work? Can you confirm? They are beautiful. Okay, great. Yeah. So actually, that's a great point. So if I want to, if I want to rephrase your question, that really comes back to the actually to the first basically a slide that I show you when I wanted to motivate GRMSG simulations and the necessity to actually test off with them in our exploration. So as you already told me, actually, there are many different basically morphologies of the magnetic field and also initial torus that you are actually that you could imagine to propose when you initiate your GRMSG simulations. And needless to say, they are going to be shown up differently in your actually in your observations, as you see, in terms of the brightness distribution, in terms of the spectra and so on and so forth, in terms of the sizes and shapes and everything actually. So one of the discoveries that we have done actually uh, basically by the ESG we've been able to do is that as you see them here, okay, if I want just to go to the bottom of it actually, only mad mothers that you see them here, only two mad mothers would survive. And like what you said, that actually tells us that ESG observations of Sagge star is actually preferring magnetically arrested disk. So that's exactly true. And of course, if you could just dig it into in more details, hopefully, hopefully after we also get into a little bit actually hands of the polarimetry of Sagge star, uh, my answer would be hopefully yes. So far, we know that it cannot be sane. It cannot be actually, uh, you know, magnetically weak. Or, or if I want just to just to talk intuitively, it cannot be actually containing a weak magnetic field structure. So that should be super strong. That should be really disk structure, uh, like this like a structure or this like morphology. But if you really want to go even to more and more of the magnetic field structure. I should tell you that that really actually goes to basically to actually to the polarimetry analysis that people have done formerly in 2021 for MAD7 that they really discover for the first time that MAD is actually preferred also for MAD7. So we are going to continue with our analysis and go for the polarimetry of Sagittarius star and hopefully after that we can get a sense or actually or a hand of the magnetic field morphology of the of uh, of Sagittarius star actually, and and from that we can hopefully slowly try to go backward to the initial torus condition. But even now we know that it should be magnetically arrested disk as a as an initial condition for your you know for your magnetic field for your basically simulation. So I hope that that answer a little bit your question or. Do you need more of the explanation or something? No, no, that, that perfectly understands or answers my question. Um, if I may be allowed to keep asking questions. Go ahead, Rob. Um, no, so, go for it. All right. Uh, so uh, you actually answered the question I posted, but I'm going to sort of rephrase that. So okay. I saw the, the resolution element you said was around 25 micro arc seconds. Uh -huh. And you and you did make the claim that uh, essentially we have we can't really trust those bright spots that we see because they're comparable yes. in size to the resolution element. What mm -hmm. I um, what I'm curious about is that you showed a lot of uh, a number of models with filamentary structure. Um, how well can we rely on those mm -hmm. um, given the the resolution of of the telescope or the array? I see. So yeah, that's a that's a great point. If I want to rephrase again your question, you're saying that all of these different models they do actually contain different uh, different structures, right? Like a poloidal and toroidal magnetic field structures, and that's a really great point because that was exactly the reason that our basically you know library of the GRMSG simulation contains three different or three completely different actually sets of GRMSG simulation because we want it to be as unbiased as possible. Let me again share my screen because maybe maybe I should just, I should actually keep it shared, but I just want to also see the people that are talking. So let me actually, again, that's, a, that's an incredibly good question that you asked me. So let me go to the library of the GRMSG simulation. 
So if I want, again, the way that I understand your question is that, of course, depending on your initial condition, on your torus and everything, you may just be biased, actually, either, you know, either substantially or at least a little bit with your sets and everything. So because of that, we tried many different cases. This is karma, hammer, and back simulation. This is from Illinois. Hammer is from the CFA, actually, that Kashuk and myself are actually doing the images for them. And back is from, actually, from some people in Germany, for instance. There are some Nafemo mothers, there are teacher disc mothers, the Game Boy Hammer simulation, and also some other people. There are some stellar wind mothers by wrestler, for instance. There are some Coralie simulations by, for instance, by Ramesh, actually, at uh, basically Ramesh Naran, as you all know him, uh, basically in, in the CFA, actually, and some critical beta mothers, which is semi analytical mothers by actually by Richa Anantu and, and Angelo Ricarti. So the fact is that. We wanted to be as unbiased as possible to the best of our ability so far, just to bring in many different images. Each of them contain hundreds of thousands of images of their own simulation. We tried to do analysis completely independently using all of different sets of simulation that I just spoke about them. And we tried to combine and actually compare the results of each other. So for instance, as you are asking, and of course, admittedly, you are very actually you're very expert on the feed. Let me just try to show one or two slides that I just hided them. So for instance, in this actually, in these two slides, you see that how much different observational constraints are actually gonna to be shown. And you see that there were three different models that we actually consider these standard models. And the green means that pass all of them, all three of them actually pass, pass some means that one set or two set of them would actually pass the constraints and the others don't and fail. It just means that all three of different sets of the hammer, actually karma and back are gonna to fail the constraints that we actually, that we were considering. So short, uh, long in short, sorry, in summary, that just means that being completely mindful of the possible biases that different sets and different initial conditions and different even GR MHD simulations are gonna to impose in your explorations of the actually of the you know of the constraints or even the conclusion of them we tried our best to enlarge the library as much as we could with many different things that are completely independent and we just and we just try to ask which of these models are going to survive after all of it and here is uh, actually only two different models that after all of different constraints that i just mentioned a lot uh, would actually would basically be you know would be survived or would be preferred by all of this multi-frequency analysis that we perform. So I hope that that actually that uh, somewhat um, respond your question. If not, I'm happy to to take it even from other perspective. Uh, that's good for me. Um, and I think my last question actually is more of a. So, um, <laughs> is more of a general question, sort of uh, future strategy. So uh, is there plan or are there plans to uh, continue imaging other supermassive black holes so that we might get an understanding of the size of the accretion disk uh, as a function of whether the star is quiescent or active? Um, yeah, like an that, that's another perfect question. Actually, yes and no. There are already some explorations going on in the EHD that has been basically published, you know, OJ287, you know, two, basically 2C, yeah, 3C, sorry, 2C, and there are just many different sources and measures, actually. Some of them, they have been used basically for the collab, for the calibrations of the, of the main sources that now you can go and actually look at their data. It might be that the collaboration also go for M31, for instance. So the dream is that at the end of the day, you could enlarge like LIGO. Of course, for us, it's much, much, much harder because we are completely resolved. We are completely actually detail analysis up to down to the horizon scale and shadow stars and everything. But if you could, if you could make even more progress in actually considering the near horizon, that is basically M87 and Sagittarius star and far horizon, for instance, TDC 279 for the jet and so forth, that would be fantastic. So 
long in short, some some efforts are already on their way, basically on the way actually, and some of them they already published some nature papers of the sources that I mentioned, and actually, and some of those would be a little bit more futuristic, you know, and a lot of more others would not be actually available for us by the current architecture of the ESG. So hopefully we should wait for the next generation of the Event Horizon Telescope to get a, to get a hand of all of the remaining parts actually, you know, both the closed by sources and also farther out. But that's, that's what we have so far, yeah. Well, my last comment, I, pro I promise, is as a <laughs> optical <laughs> IR, uh, as an optical IR and interferometrist, I think that radio interferometry is just cheating um, okay. because we <laughs> so because optical interferometries are uh, optical interferometers are never going to get so solid, so large to actually get so uh, synthesize the Earth as a so yeah. yeah dirty dirty cheaters. All right, thank you uh, again. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I will probably will be in touch. Sure, absolutely. That will be my great pleasure. All right. Thank, thanks, Rob. Um, let's go to Alex um, Gorbachev. All right. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Just a yeah. quick question. So the simulations, where did the data for the simulations come from? It's actually a question from my daughter. <laughs> oh, my dear. All right. So let me let me try my best, actually. So the fact is that, OK, so, you know, that's a that's a very great question. So actually, you know, we, the data uh, from the simulations come from uh, RCEF, actually. So this is again very wise, and very wise question because, you know, unlike the ESG data that are coming from the telescopes, that are coming from the interferometry that we've been actually observing by the ESG, by the simulations, you know, we try to model them. We try to come up with some reasonable assumptions of the of the model. We have a good setup of the initial condition. How should it look like, you know, at different black hole spins, at different inclination as a post processor, you know, at different magnetic fields, actually, you know, configurations and so forth. And we try to run them over the time. So you have a supermassive black hole at the center, and it's, of course, some initial actually condition or initialization of the torus as an initial condition that you have. And you just try to actually, you just try to basically evolve the system over the time, basically under very reasonable assumptions, and you get actually, you get the light that is just coming from different parts of the black hole, and then you just try to ray trace them, you know, and then that would be similar to what you are actually, what you've been observed by the ESG. So if I want to actually tell you exactly, basically the one that is here, basically, right, or even after that, so that's actually, that's basically um, answering in another way your question. So in the in the second to the left and to the third to the left or in the in the in the in the basically two main actually median basically plus that or panels that you see here they are all coming from the GRMSG simulations while this one is from the observation so the data is basically created by us but under very reasonable assumption so what is the purpose of doing that the purpose is that we want to know we want to get a good understanding of the source actually morphology actually you know in terms of the magnetic field structure in terms of the boost actually in terms of beaming etc lensing and so forth and in order to understand the observations we had no other choice to model them you know by our own actually hand and then try to compare them with what has been observed by the ESG. So I hope that that would respond your question. So long in short, we made them, but in a good reason, actually. The reason was that we wanted to compare them with the observation. So hope that answer your question. If not, I'm happy to, to add a little bit more. Thank you. So in other words, you're just testing a theory basically that way. Uh, and yes, actually capability of the theory to to explain the observation. Yes, exactly. So geometry simulations are lab on Earth, actually. We just, they are very useful in many different actual cases. Even sometimes extracting the data from the observations is not that easy. For instance, I told you that Sagestar was time variable. We had to come up with this full track observation that we actually came up with some random, basically, 
you know, realizations and come up with some noise modelings and so forth. So a lot of those parameters were extracted from the simulation. I told you about a mass measurement of suggest or any other sources and the alpha calibration that was the constant of the motion that was connecting actually the source size that you see on the sky and also comparing this with the mass of the black hole and the distance that you have the good measurement from other observations. So again, in this case, also simulations are incredibly useful. So all in all, all it actually means is that simulations are a good, basically, you know, a strategy and necessary also not only for actually for themselves to basically to, um, to get us a good hand of the magnetic field morphology and so forth, of observe so, but also to be able to even observe, you know, or to finish our observation if you want, or to have a good interpretation of the observed data, actually. So, yeah, that's that's a little bit of, you know, basically back and forth between the observation and simulation. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. I think, John, did you have a question, McD McDonald? Yes, I uh, just wondered what software you use to take the terabytes of data and sift it down to the images that you show us? Well, that's not, that's, that wasn't really easy, actually. So I can tell you that there are a lot of supercomputers and a lot of uh, storages, actually, that uh, they were, they were really had to go for. And I have heard that, honestly, they had some uh, airplanes, actually, that they were just like, basically, you know, collecting all the data and just like, putting them, you know, in some particular place, for instance, at, you know, at MIT or other places that they were then actually being analyzed by the, you know, by some, by some very expert people. So in fact, like what you said, we are dealing with the terabytes of the data and they had to be shipped, you know, to a very particular place, you know, so that uh, definitely that's not my expertise, but that's completely non-trivial and yeah. I should, I should, you know, I should admit that, you know, that was one of the hardest part of the, of the analysis, actually. Thank you. Yeah, Excellent so, presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was kind of wondering too, it took a long time, because I think as I was reading, the data was collected several years ago, right, for this, and only recently. Yeah, exactly. So that's actually, yeah, that's basically, admittedly, that was a very, very, very hard journey. Because you could imagine like what I told you actually already at the beginning of my presentation, you would you may expect that Star is the second source in the in the series of the of the data analysis or resub images by the ESG. So you may expect that that should be much easier, but that was completely wrong, you know, because after 2017 data was 2017 data, of course, about two years that actually took the collaboration to just focus on MAD7 with a lot of Pre, pre actually pre processing and post processing and calibrations and analysis and algorithm developments and everything. But after 2019, of course, uh, COVID was also actually slowing us, everybody in the world. But uh, starting from 2020 to 2021, the end of 2021, that was a lot of actually, uh, you know, basically explorations and developments of the techniques that was just essential for Sagittarius start. So prior to that, there was almost no techniques to capture the time variabilities and all of them were needed to be actually developed and tested or just like checked around the, you know, basically yeah, in the entire of the 300 forks at different locations. So that was not really easy. And sometimes they had multiple techniques just to check the same things, just to cross check and cross validate or something. Yeah. So that was that was that was completely non-trivial efforts by the by huge number of people. Yeah, thank you. That does, that's an incredible <laughs> achievement. I think we had one more here, unless there's a go go back on for anybody. But uh, I, Iman, did you want to ask your question? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Paul uh, Razia. Thank you so much. Incredible presentation. Uh, so Sorry. I am coming uh, from another background, uh, not astro in astronomy, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually a data scientist. And I would like to know, I'm, I'm, my question is probably different a little bit. 
uh, I would like to know if you are familiar with any uh, department like da data analysis department or data analysis projects in astronomy that you would uh, refer to me. I would like to know about, you know, the projects that going on in astronomy. I'm really excited uh, with this uh, with this field of uh, science and would like to contribute in future. Oh, yeah, so sure, actually, yeah, that might be more of the, you know, basically uh, one to one uh, question. So I'm not sure how many other people in this actually call will be interested to hear, of course, but long and short, yes, there are some institutions that are actually that are looking for data scientists. It also depends on your level and your expertise, you know, of course, there are hirings all over different places that you could just you could just Google it or you could just go to their institutions in particular for for staff for basically for the ESG. I know that some people are actually looking for some specialists of the, you know, of the data analysis. So that's a very good technique that you have. But in terms of the details of what is their hiring right now or are they going to hire right now or would that be in the next few months or so? Unfortunately, I'm not that familiar with that actually, but I would recommend you to with, uh, with whoever you want to work or with whoever you want to actually, you, you want to be in charge or, you know, or basically just do the analysis or helping them with those analysis, just contact them and just, you know, they have good answers, but most of the times these nowadays are everything is just online. So you can just, you can just look it up and, you know, Right. Sometimes some connections may also help and so forth. But yeah, if others also have other recommendations, I would, I would, I would just, I would just, you know, ask them to rest to talk. Yeah, you know, John, are you talking? I don't hear you actually. Yeah, I was. Uh, oh, yeah, I was. Uh, I was going to say thank you so much. Uh, it it was not about just uh, working uh, in this area because I'm also a PhD student. I would like to know about oh. the like uh, uh, edge of the. Uh, data analysis project in astronomy and would like to more about uh, know more about the uh, you know the the, the theoretical uh, challenges that you you may face and these kind of uh, you know just more yeah about actually that. yeah that that's a very good yeah that's a very good question for instance some of the challenges that people were faced on was just like some developing some machine learning algorithms and especially nowadays. There is something called NGESD, next generations of the ESG. So for those of you that might be interested, this actually collaboration is completely open. If you are interested, you can just you can just contact them. There are a lot of actually, uh, you know, telecoms every week or so that prepare. I, I don't know what would be actually in the near future, whether they would be they would they would contain that regular basically discussions or so. But the fact is that uh, nowadays, you know, there are a lot of things through the Zoom that I would recommend you to join them, you know. Of course, there are a lot of things on the ground that uh, people need some experts, actually, specialists to, to come up and just uh, just help with, you know. It also depends on your actually, you know, exact interests and so forth. But yes, of course, machine learning and some statistical analysis that would be really required, you know just like data reduction or actually calibration or something, you know, there are, there, are, there are tons of things that people can contribute based on their specialists and also their interest, you know, focus on everything actually. So I apologize that I don't have more of the, of the actually of the guys on this floor, but I would recommend you just to go and see what are your actually expertise and what is your passion in this field and just just go from that actually okay. Hope thank that you so much. your question thank you very much thank you uh if i may be uh, able to tack on to that i would uh, the from an astronomical point of view i know that the vera rubin telescope is going to need a lot of data scientists uh, because it's taking i think it's 10 uh, tens of if not hundreds of terabytes of data a day um it's going. It's basically a large survey telescope that surveys the entire sky. I think three times or every the entire sky in three days, and it's going to continually do that. That it, that's its mission. Thank you, Rob. All right, nice. Okay, JB, you get one more question. Uh, it's just a suggestion. Uh, I'm in might want to find out the names of the organizations that are involved in the uh, in this prog pro program 
and uh, then he can search through them to find one or two that are nearby and have the personality that he's looking for, the profile of research that he's looking for. Do you have such a list or have any idea where one might be, Doctor? But are you asking me particularly or asking Rob? Well, I was asking you because you're involved in the project. You probably know where there are where there might be a, a list of the project participants, the co corporate uh, corporations and institutions that are participating. In your oh, project. sorry. I, I thought that you're talking about uh, I apologize. I thought that you're responding. Actually, the, the former question regarding to this data analysis. Yeah, I think that if you actually go to the CFA website, there is actually something called ESG. And if you go over that, I think that the list of the actually list of the organizations or institutions that has contributed in the observation, they are all listed there. They are, they are just, you know, it's just like a global basically effort. So a lot of institutions in the US, in Canada, in Asia, in Europe, you know, just all over the in the UK actually, just everywhere nowadays they contribute almost. And yeah. In terms of the direct link now, unfortunately, I don't have it. But I think that if you could just Google it, just like go to the basically Google, just like maybe saying that the institutions involved in the ESG, I think you would just get an answer. I can list few of them, but I would imagine that you would you would like to have a very big list of the institutions that that's actually that has participated in this observation, if I understand it correctly. For instance, in Boston, basically we have Harvard, we have MIT, you know, the his stack actually. There are, you know, there are, there are various different institutions that are basically either in my city or in other cities or even countries. Actually, they are, they are basically focusing on these observations and the analysis of it and so forth. Yeah. Great. Does that answer your question or? 